welcome to a brand new episode of Seize the Moment podcast. And today we have a very special guest. Today we have on Eric Engner. He's professor of practical philosophy at Stockholm University. He holds two PhDs, one in economics and one in history and philosophy of science. He's the author of several books, Hayek and Natural Law, and a course in behavioral economics, as well as multiple journal articles and book chapters on behavioral and experimental economics, the science and philosophy of happiness, and the history, philosophy, and methodology of contemporary economics. His most recent book, available now, is called How Economics Can Save the World, Simple Solutions to Solve Our Biggest Problems. Welcome, Eric, and thank you for coming on. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. Absolutely. And to quote from Eric's book, Eric wrote, economics has been, he's been about making the world a better place, more fit for, for human flourishing since day one. The reason it exists is that moral philosophers recoiled against widespread misery and suffering and thought a scientific economics could help relieve it. When economics was attacked as the dismal science and maybe even the work of the devil himself back in the 19th century, economists were already busy opposing slavery and injustice. The discipline has come a long way since then, but the ambition to help people lead better lives and improve the world is still alive and well. Economics delivers the next best thing after silver bullets and magic wands, actionable evidence-based solutions that can, on the margin, improve human lives, people commu people's communities, and the world that we live in. The advice is distinctive in the sense that it differs from what's already on offer elsewhere. It's not obvious in the sense that it's not always what you'd expect. And economics helps us face big challenges and, s challenges and small annoyances. It paves the way for eliminating poverty. It gives advice about how to raise well-adjusted children, and no less importantly for every Everybody involved, remain sane in the process. It tells us how to deal with climate change and pollution. It tells us how to encourage pro-social behaviors and promote human rights. It promotes, it provides us with algorithms that save lives and give people what they need. It tells us how to be happy, humble, and rich, possibly even at the same time. And it tells us how to build sustainable and resilient communities within the boundaries set by the planet on which we live. The advice is designed to benefit us, our communities, and the world as a whole. So I love that. And just to begin, I guess, a little bit more simply for our audience, because your conception of economics is a little bit different from what we normally think of. And I love that you address that in the book. So when we think of economics, we think about finance in the big picture. We think about uh, sort of like markets, uh, buying and selling, uh, stocks, commodities, sort of uh, how do we make a living? How do people profit? But we never think about economics in terms of sort of the relationships themselves, at least, you know, popularly speaking. Mm -hmm. So in terms of the relationships themselves, and then broadly speaking about what the resources are and how do we allocate them within those relationships. So Eric, can you first define what you mean by economics and then also tell us about why it was sort of seemed as or seemed or perceived as a kind of the devil science or you know <laughs> as a satanic in some way yeah no that's a great place to start uh leon i appreciate that so um there are lots of misconceptions about what economics is right we associate it with money finance we might associate it with greed um all sorts of anti-social behavior or whatever and we might associate it with some of the figures we've seen in the press who don't always make you know an excellent first impression on people let's let's face it but economics isn't isn't that or at least it isn't that alone it is a science of behavior in a situation when resources are scarce. And what that means is when there isn't enough to go around, when, when there is less around than we would want. In that sense, everybody faces scarcity independently of how rich and so on we are. We still have to make choices. The fact that we have to make choices forces us to make trade-offs between different goods. And those trade-offs are going to be scientifically interesting. And then, of course, economists are interested in not just the individual lever, level behavior, but in the macro level consequences of behavior. So what happens at the group level or at the nation level when people behave in a certain manner at the individual level? And this is fascinating because there's sometimes like a disconnect between the two levels, right? You might think that what happens at the macro level has got to be the result of an explicit design from some individual sitting there as the, you know, spider in the middle of the web or whatever. But that's often not true. Like things can happen at the macro level without anyone intending them or foreseeing them. And that's absolutely critical if you want to understand so some of the big challenges that we're facing um, as a species. Right? If you're looking at climate change or antisocial behavior or uh, all sorts of, sort of destructive norms that are in place, very often nobody intended for that 
to happen. These things happen as a result of individual goal-directed behavior. And mm -hmm. if you want to solve them, even if you want to just take the first couple of steps toward solving them, it's going to be critical to have a proper appreciation of the process by which it emerged. And that's sort of one of the things that economics can tell us about. Mm, I love that. And you know, thinking about it, just because we've had several uh, people who are experts in conspiracy theories on and conspiracy theories on. So it's like we tend to think of so poverty is the first chapter that you start off with. And we tend to think of blame, right? So who do we blame for something? I, I think a lot of times it's because we're looking to either obviously sometimes problem solve, but also sometimes to kind of get the problem away from us to say that's you, that's your fault. Mm -hmm. So when we think of poverty, we either if you let's say you're a conspiracy theorist, this is why I'm on the subject, you think there's a sort of global elite that's keeping everybody down and keeping everybody poor. But if you're a little bit on the further kind of right, or actually in the more middle right, you tend to blame people. You say, well, poverty is your fault. So how would economics in this case address poverty? And how would we ascribe sort of responsibility or assign responsibility? Well, so f lots of lots of aspects to that problem. Like, first off, I think many economists would say that the thing that needs explaining isn't so much poverty as riches. riches. Mm -hmm. So humankind was poor for basically the duration, right? Mm -hmm. It's only in the last 100, 150 years that people have started getting, you know, as spectacularly rich as many people are, are now. So in a way, just like asking for an explanation of poverty might be the wrong place to start. But then economics is not that interested in sort of pinning blame on on people the question that economists will ask like given where we are what can we do to make the situation better so uh, you know this is where marginal thinking comes in right economists will tell you to think on the margin and what that means is you know don't don't start from like the beginning of the universe or the end times or something start from where we are and ask yourself what can we do right here to make things better for people and that's the sort of area where you find most research by economists like what can we do and here there's a radical difference between what economists will tell us we can do about poverty and what many people in the general culture and politics and so on will tell you. So if you listen to politicians, very often the message is the poor people have it too easy, right? Their lives are too uh, comfortable. We need to make their lives harder, right? We can't give them cash. We need to give them food coupons and we can't allow the food coupons to be used for like delicious hot food. It can only be used for like cold food and vegetables and, and so on. And so there's a lot of moralizing there. There's a lot of paternalism and there's a, a, an explanatory picture that tells you the central problem is that the poor have it too easy. The economists by and large will tell you the opposite is true. The hmm. reason why poor people are poor is that they don't have money. The way to fix poverty is to give them more money and to make their lives easier. Um, part of making their lives easier involves removing restrictions and regulations on their behavior and in particular on their ability to make a living, right? So rules that the government has put in place to that make it hard to become a, a hairdresser, for example, makes it harder for poor people to make money as a hairdresser, as a hairdresser, it's pretty obvious if you if you think about it. And then there's a ton of research just suggesting that what the poor people need the most is uh, money. And then you might say like, woo woo, like, what if we give poor people money, right? Aren't they going to spend it all on like, yeah, drugs and alcohol, yeah, rock and roll, right? <laughs> <laughs> and you know, that, that that's a legitimate question, right? It's a question that you can ask. But economists have studied this, and they've done it by means of randomized control trials, which is, you know, often referred to as the gold standard in social, biological, medical sciences, and whatever. And what they find is that if you give poor people cash, they spend it wisely, not, you know, 100% wisely, but like nobody does, right? Um, they're no better and no worse at spending money than other people, there is some indication that they might even be better, wiser with money, because if you're poor, hmm. the, your decisions count for a lot more, right? It's like, you know, people who have 
or reasonably affluent are playing in easy mode, right? You make a couple of mistakes, doesn't really matter, it might hurt a little, you'll be embarrassed, but you'll be fine. Whereas if you're balancing on the edge of the precipice, even a relatively minor problem can have very severe downstream consequences for you and your, your family. So um, there's no reason to think that poor people are worse at spending money than anybody else, and there's some reason to think that they're better at it. So what you should do, economists will say, is just like give them cash, you know, give them cash so they can feed themselves, house themselves and their families so they can start a business, um, so that they can get back on their on their feet. And a, the thing that's interesting is that you, you might think of like the general plan of giving cash to poor people as a sort of lunatic, lefty, French sort of idea. But economists have endorsed this idea. Economists from left to right have endorsed this idea uh, for uh, generations. So Friedrich von Hayek um, is somebody you know people might have heard of, right? Austrian economist, free market guy. Uh, a, a friend and fan of, of Reagan and Thatcher, and they were fans of, of his and so on. He wrote about this and he said to give poor people money. He was in favor of an unconditional basic income, which is basically the government collecting cash where it can find it and then giving everyone a certain chunk of money. From Hayek's perspective, that was fair. It was efficient, right? Very little waste. It's much harder to distribute things like bread and butter and grain and things, right? They go bad, they're harder to transport. Distributing mm -hmm. cash is, is much better. You respect people's autonomy by giving them cash. You treat them with respect and you allow them to spend the money on whatever they need the most. Right? So some poor people will need food. Uh, right? They'll need the bread. Some poor people need money to invest in a business. Some people might need money for a cow, right? Some people might need, you, you see where I'm getting with this, right? Mm -hmm. And who's yeah. going to know what that particular poor family needs more than anything? Well, it's that particular poor family, right? So we have a picture here of like basically taking from the rich and giving to the poor and vast well, even, numbers even for of the economists will tell you. Yeah, and even for the rich too, because anybody who's ever run a business knows that we need supplies, we need people. It's not just, you know, we're sorry, we need the demand. So just because we have the supplies for them, it doesn't necessarily mean that it, it will equate to that. So what's interesting too is that in some ways it all kind of cycles back into the economy. Wouldn't you understand? Yeah, and, and it, it's so counterintuitive, right? One would think, uh, right, that people would sort of get lazier, right, if, if you kind of hand them money. But uh, I can see how if their needs are met, they have enough sort of mental resource or resource capital to sort of think about other things, maybe creative pursuits. Not just that, uh, if uh, if you take people out of poverty, that should theoretically reduce crime as well, which serves those uh, people uh, in affluent positions. Right. So it's very interesting. Hmm. Yeah. So when people say, like, if you give people money, they'll just spend it on sex and drugs and rock and roll. I always want to say, like, speak for yourself, man, because <laughs> the evidence suggests that's not what people do in general. Some do, right? Some rich people do too. Um, yeah. But on the whole, it's not like poor people are any worse at spending money than the rest of us are. I'm sure you guys are super wise, uh, whatever. I'm not. Um, <laughs> Yeah, and with this, so, so, <laughs> what, what sort of comes to mind is even something like Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Like, of course, people are going to focus on their needs. So if you think about somebody surviving, I mean, unless somebody is a significant, uh, let's say, addict, I mean, that does happen where sometimes with something like addiction, people do spend money more so on the drugs than anything else. I mean, that does happen. But for the most part, if people need food, I mean, they're going to eat. So again, if you think about like the hierarchy of needs and you think about getting them obviously met, I mean, the idea is it's like, you know, the, as the pyramid goes higher, when you're, you're trying to get those needs met, so you're probably going to spend the money on the lower rungs of that ladder as opposed to some of the higher ones. And I would argue maybe not drugs, but the higher ones are like fun, you know, self-actualizing and, you know, let's say, I don't know, uh, whatever it is, you know, having a good time in the world. Or just skill building, right? Yeah. If, if, you're, if you're in a sort of a survival sort of mode right you cannot think anything ex about anything except for just getting the resources you need just to make it through the day right but if yeah. those needs are met then you can start thinking about those things you you now have uh you know time resource where you can 
uh, work on building skills or uh, making connections right. or what have you. Right. Yeah, yeah. No, exactly right. I mean, you're you're getting it. So um, I should add, though, that this is only like part of the picture, right? There's a lot more to this. Um, mm -hmm. And, um, you know, no economist would say that we should just toss money at poor people and walk away, right? There are other things that might be useful as well. So if there's addiction, right, specific kinds of interventions might be suitable for that. Um, but it's important to to understand also that the sort of interventions that economists suggest and sort of things we'll be talking about today mm -hmm. aren't normally seen as, you know, something that can replace everybody else. So when economists say it's good to give money to poor people, they don't mean we should stop everything else we're doing for poor people. We might need to do these things together, right, at the same right. time for right. best effect. Yeah. And so uh, this also makes me think of what we have in the US is what we call the welfare queen here. And so what's interesting about how that myth spread was it was actually based on the it was a real person, the person who was the welfare queen. I do not remember her name. And it was this lady who legit like she had a ton of money. She was, I, I think, a madam where she had hookers who were working for her. Or sex workers, whatever you want to call them. Um, so yeah, so she had these people working for her, and essentially, so she she pretty much scammed the system, right? And Reagan pointed her out and he said, Well, look, here's the evidence that these people are doing this. And this kind of this trope, it's sort of passed on from generation to generation, even though when you look at the data here, very few people actually scam the welfare system. It's not that it doesn't exist, but it's so minuscule compared to probably even white collar crimes that happen here all the time, notoriously. And somebody like Bernie Madoff has stole way more money probably than the entire population has scammed welfare. Uh, so what's interesting about that is that, you know, you take this idea and you, with something, you know, called the availability heuristic, and it sort of, it pops up in, from mind to mind because it's so easily available. You can point at that person and say, oh, well, see, this is what happens on welfare. But again, it's so interesting because it's literally just a couple of people who are doing this. So this lady was a sociopath. I mean, these diagnoses, they, they exist in very few people in the population. But again, this trope is so popular here. And it sort of begs the question of why is it? So, I mean, maybe this is a difficult one to answer, but why? Why is it that you think that people are so they're kind of so set on just kind of hanging on to that and saying, you know what, I'm not giving my money to these people. It's not going to benefit them and it's not going to benefit me. Well, you mentioned part of the story, I think, which has to do with availability, right? We've been told these stories about individuals who are scamming the system or whatever. And obviously, as you say, these people exist, right? There are people like this. And there are people like this in every stratum, too. Um, and part of the problem here is that like, stories like these are like, so extremely effective. They really have an ability to like grab our attention and, mm -hmm. and um, sort of enter our mental life. This is great in many ways, right? If you like reading novels, short stories, that's wonderful. Um, if you write, if you're trying to direct people's attention, like using it by means of stories is very effective. But we also have an ability to sort of be led astray by stories. We, we think these stories are so vivid, which causes us to think of them as more common than they are, um, which makes them gives them completely unreasonable weight in our deliberation. The antidote to this kind of negative effect of stories is data, right? If you go out there and look at data to see like how many people like this are there, how many people of the other kind are there and whatever, then you can begin to get a sense for like where the problem really lies and what you can do about it. But m most people can't handle data in that way. Data are hard um, mm -hmm. to process. They're hard to analyze. And um, the moment you hear one of these vivid stories of a welfare queen or something, you know, the your theoretical understanding might go out the window. And so this is a, a challenge. It's a challenge for everyone who works with science and, and data, right? We will use stories. We ought to use stories to convey information. You've noticed I do that in, in the book, right? The reason why I do it is that it works. Um, but we also need to be alert to the ways in which stories lead us astray. And this is a great example of that. I love it. And it seems like in terms of the, if we could pick on, let's say one theme, I mean, obviously there are several, but if we could pick out one theme from the book, I mean, it seems to be resource allocation. That seems to be super important. So now going into climate change, it also, again, seems like using resources is sort of, if not the answer, one of the main answers. But again, people don't like that. People hear something like carbon tax and they would say, oh my God, I don't want that. That's big government, big brother. I want nothing to do with that. So how do we tackle that? Yeah, so it was one thing about climate change is um, that people 
might not know is that economists are by and large agreed on what needs to be done. Economists are by and large agreed on the fact that it's a major problem, that humans cost it, that it requires urgent action. And uh, what economists sort of overwhelmingly agree on is that we should handle it by taxing the people who pollute the most. There was a call for action that came out just a couple of years ago after the big annual economic conference in, in the US that's been signed by thousands of economists and economists from left to right, some very prominent figures as well. The story here is that if you tax the people who pollute, the people who generate the carbon dioxide and the other greenhouse gases, well, then you're going to make their life harder. You're going to make their products more expensive. Relatively speaking, that's going to make the other products cheaper. So what's, what, what does that mean? Well, it means that consumers will shift to goods that are produced in a less carbon dioxide intensive kind of way that's going to put pressure on the polluters so they're going to have to be more efficient they're going to have to figure out a way to do whatever they're doing with less emissions and um, they're going to have to find sort of ways to transition away from that kind of of uh, uh, operation and so by taxing the people who produce the carbon dioxide, you can shift people away from those sorts of, of goods and services. Again, this is not a magic bullet, right? It doesn't replace all the other things that we might want to do to tackle climate change, but it's a pretty simple idea. And there's actually some evidence that it works. I mean, nobody has tried it on a global scale, but there are mm -hmm. countries that have tried things like these. And, um, you know, they're not going to fix the problem by themselves you know, in the short term, but they do seem to make a sizable difference. And it's just fascinating. There's several things that are fascinating about this. One is that the economics profession, which is otherwise quite diverse, I mean, there are people on the left and on the right within the profession, right, mm -hmm. that they virtually, well, you know, very large numbers of them agree that this is the way to deal with, with the problem. That's fascinating um, on it, in its own right. And that's kind of fascinating that so many economists can endorse this particular plan. They've articulated the plan. There's a website um, that explains it, I think, in, in human readable terms. And yet this initiative has had virtually zero impact on the public discussion about climate change. It's kind of curious, right? Hmm. Um, economists, I guess, are not very good at sort of setting the agenda getting their their ideas out but there's also not a whole lot of demand for economists ideas like some people think economists get too much attention at the expense of whatever it is anthropologists and sociologists and philosophers and maybe that's true but even so like economists who have this suggestion that might work that you know could be could be implemented is um has had very little impact on the the conversation yeah. And in terms of misinformation, I remember, I think this was maybe about 10 years ago. I mean, maybe he's still saying the same stuff. Maybe not. I mean, I'm hesitant to bring him up, but I will. Alex Jones. So the way he used to present the carbon tax here was that essentially everybody's uh, kind of contributing to in his understanding or you know, if, if you could call it that, I don't know. OK, so but in his kind of conception, he says essentially everybody's contributing to the carbon footprint and, you know, the big brother kind of narrative in the narrative. Right. So in the big brother narrative, everybody's contributing to the carbon to carbon footprint we're all eating meat they want to ban meat and they want to tax you for eating meat so of course when people listen to that they're going to say oh my god they want to tax me for eating meat i don't want that so what happens is the two get conflated it goes from okay carbon right. tax on the so-called polluters to like oh oh all human beings are polluters because we're eating meat so obviously i'm assuming that's not what really that's not the intention behind the carbon tax they don't want to tax right. everybody who eats meat <clears throat> That's not the idea, right? right? Not under that description. And we haven't even talked about the best thing about this, which is that the uh, revenue, the money that the government collects is supposed to go back to people in the form of a, a lump sum payment, a regular payment, you know, some money that appears in your in your bank account. Mm -hmm. And what that means is that if you have a relatively light carbon footprint, you're going to come out ahead, you're going to end up with more money after the imposition of the tax than you did before. If you have a very heavy carbon footprint, you won't come out ahead, right? Um, mm -hmm. But that has to do with choices that you make as an individual of fly flying private planes to the Bahamas and, you know, eating a lot of meat and what whatever it might be. And so there's no ban involved in this, right? You can still do these things if you like, you just have to pay for the cost 
of you know the degrading climate and um it's not a you know a, a sort of leftist authoritarian proposal either because the whole idea is to harness the power of the market, right? The market is amazing when it comes to innovation. You give companies free reins and the ability to innovate and what, the, and they will, right? And what the tax is supposed to do is supposed to drive that kind of innovation. So you, this is a market-based, you know, from that respect, you might think right-wing uh, um, suggestion, but um, yeah, I think, I think we should try it. Uh, it's not the only thing we should do to deal with climate change, but it's a pretty good start where it would be if people got around to implementing right. it. Right. And just to be clear, we're not saying that people who eat meat are going to be charged thousands upon thousands of dollars in taxes. Correct. Correct. Right. Like yeah. One steak is not going to you know, translate. <laughs> yeah. I don't know in dollars and cents, right? Or in cents, but it's not going to be yeah. like that much. Yeah, it's kind of interesting. I mean, not to get into this too much, but you often have, especially on the right with somebody like, let's say Jordan Peterson too, but Alex Jones, you have a lot of paranoia. So when you have something like the carbon tax, so let's go into sort of why economists, I mean, obviously maybe we don't really know the answer, uh, but this happens with a lot of science and economy, obviously in, in economics rather in particular in this case, is that it's, it's so interesting how much misinformation and paranoia is out there. But then how do we sort of, how do we get to the point where this information becomes more easily distillable and it, where it becomes Becomes, you know, something you and I talk about becomes a little bit more widespread and popularized because what happens is, you know, you do hear somebody like Alex Jones and then he will say, well, yeah, they're going to tax you for, you know, eating meat. And there's nobody on the other side saying, well, actually, that's not really true. So how do we kind of get this debate rolling? Because technically, a lot of times academia, they think they're above it. So they think they're above the Alex Joneses and the Jordan Petersons. And this stuff really doesn't get challenged on the public platform, on a public sphere or in the public sphere or whatever public platform. Yeah, no. So how, how do we deal with this? I, I don't know. I mean, there's a, a literature and you guys might know this as well as as I do, right? But on sort of science denial and fact resistance and so on. And part of it has to do or the story that people will tell now is that to some extent, there's a lack of literacy, right? There's a, right. a you know low scientific literacy. People mm -hmm. don't quite know how science works and, you, you know, how scientists come up with their ideas and what it means to defend a scientific theory or whatever. But that's only a small part of the story a much bigger part of the story has to do with trust. Right. Like why um, do people trust some figures and not others? Why is it that some countries have really low levels of trust, others have pretty high level of trust? And that seems like a much bigger driver of things like vaccine resistance, for example. Do you trust the scientists who develop the vaccine? Do you trust the corporations that are benefited from it? Do you trust the public health officials who tell you to get vaccinated or whatever? That seems to be a critical driver. And so from an economics perspective, then we should think about like, how do we get people in general to trust economists? Like how, how, how can we present ourselves in a way that makes people think of us as one of the, you know, member of the helping professions? Because we they very much don't, right? Economists have a terrible reputation. I was thinking just the other day about economists and the public eye, and there's mm -hmm. like, there's like no major figure in media and film and fiction that's Eric, an economist and that Eric, looks guess, good. Guess what? You are what? literally the first ever economist on our podcast. <laughs> yeah, I kid you. I kid you. Okay. And you are honestly the only economist I've ever known. You know what I thought so, you were going to say? What I thought you were going to say, Eric, you're the next. You're going to be that that person. No, if, but technically he is on our podcast. No, no. no <laughs> I, mean, I mean, in general. <laughs> yeah. Uh, to, to your point, Eric, um, I I agree with you, right? I I even had this thought as as you were speaking that in order for certain um, behaviors to change on, on a, on a sort of a mass level, or at least for certain ideas to be accepted, it seems to be that usually somebody like a, either a celebrity or somebody who happens to have rapport with a mass group of people tends to be able when delivering information, it, it, it gets accepted as authority essentially. Right. Um, so it, it's, it's interesting to me. I, f I feel like at least currently the medium through which uh, people will actually go with um, on a mass level information. It might actually be via podcasting. Uh, when, for example, let's say Joe Rogan uh, has either an expert on his show or maybe he keeps touting a particular idea, be it true or not, it seems that, you know, because of the the amount of listeners that sort of 
take in that information. I mean, uh, it, it seems to it seems to transfer well that way. Um, and then when somebody like, let's say, uh, I don't know if we're talking about uh, vaccines like um, Fauci, let's say, well, of course, I think uh, the, the government had an interesting strategy by having him come on weekly to um, have more exposure to an audience when delivering information about vaccines. So I think that that they were trying to think about how to approach this to get people to trust the information. So I think they were doing something smart from their end as best as they could. But um, it's clearly it's not enough. Like somebody who is delivering information on of that level needs to have more rapport. Right. Um, you know, even even the president now delivering information, it, it's so polarized, whether you know, if you're on the left or on the right, that it's not massively accepted when the president even speaks and that and that's yeah the leader of the country. So I, I think you're exactly right. You're right about podcasts. So traditional media are wonderful. So I read the New York Times and the Washington Post daily, and you know I'm getting a lot of information out of there. But the problem, of course, is that the people who read the New York Times are the people who already trust traditional yeah. media. And that's going to be correlated with trusting the government and trusting public health officials and whatever. And so that's fine. But you're not going to reach the people who most need the information, right? Who, who right. most need to get to, to, to get that information. And I think we do a terrible job at it. Sometimes I think about marketing and, you know, some products then come out that really like flop, like Google Glass, apparently, or I'm told falls in mm -hmm. this category. And you know, the glasses with like the built in camera and whatever. And yep. apparently the technology was pretty good at the time. But um, in the public eye, the technology got associated with a really dorky kind of Silicon Valley type mm -hmm. of man and a social antisocial kind of behavior. Because apparently these young men were walking around taking pictures of unsuspecting women, right, with this. Uh, and so the, the product went down, not because there was anything wrong with the technology, but because of the marketing, right? They mm -hmm. should have figured out like who the attractive appealing people are and giving them the glasses first right mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and i feel like we're making the same mistake in academia and in in economics because here we are like the dorkiest <laughs> one of the dorkiest professions trying to go out here like reaching people and uh, we're not doing very well and maybe it's because of us right maybe we should hire somebody right i don't know well Actors. i, so I I, I honestly yeah maybe uh, maybe maybe that's maybe that's the way um or at least you know uh i mean honestly there are many uh, so when joe rogan for example first came out with this podcast i was actually uh, like uh, i started listening essentially from day one right and so there are a lot of experts that he would have on the show uh, authors uh, you name it right and the people that I, I got to listen to in a long form fashion two hours three hours um speaking about whatever particular topic and that actually was a great way and I'm, i consider myself of course as one of the masses right i think we're all part of that in one way or another i know there are different demographics and you know age groups and and all that but but essentially um there's information i never would have gotten exposed to if um if i didn't hear it on a like a, a podcast like that that form of media so i don't know I, th I think there's still there's still hope uh to to get like the most essential knowledge out there it just has to i don't know opportunity and luck and um i don't know and then because it's strange how things become viral right even somebody yeah. like uh let's say rogan with his long form you know uh podcast you you people used to think that you couldn't even uh, like the, uh, a mass group of people couldn't sit down for more than a few minutes to listen to something like you almost uh, like marketers even assume low intelligence um and uh they just market to the uh uh most common denominator essentially right. but there is actually sort of an untapped group of people that apparently do have the attention span that um, maybe um, are were underestimated for some time. So maybe yeah. there's still a way to 
reach them and that could be a huge group of people right and i don't know right yeah. and we need to meet people where they are i think so yeah. i can think yeah. of one sort of shining example and it's the uh, uh italian economist who's translating the book into italian luciano canova he's mm -hmm. on TikTok and he has whatever 50 60 000 followers sort of explaining economic ideas daily and he's doing a wonderful job with it in the us i don't know that we have anyone quite yeah. like this. There are some economists, you know, Justin Wolfers, Tyler Cowen, that's maybe Paul Krugman, Paul Krugman, who are yeah. on the news, but you know, they're not, it's not accessible. It's not accessible. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. They're not, I don't think on TikTok, right. And somebody, somebody ought to be, and there's so much to talk about. Like you mentioned the dismal science, right. Uh, uh, at the outset. And so let me pick up on that and, and just ask if people know why economics is called the dismal science. I bet the answer is no. It's okay. Mm -hmm. You know, people use this as a slur. Um, you get it oftentimes, I think, from sort of left-wing progressives who think of economics as sort of dismal or, or sad or depressing because it paints a picture of human beings as like mechanistic entities consisting of little atoms and you know the message being boring and two-dimensional and so on but that's not at all none of that is true by the way and it's not at all the story so the story is that back in when in its infancy when economics was the fresh um uh, science um you know in the 19th century economists were arguing for uh, everyone's for equality the mm -hmm. equality across uh, people and they were arguing specifically against slavery in the caribbean and so there was a historian in the uk thomas carlyle who was very upset about this he thought it was completely ridiculous for the economists to oppose slavery and he's the one who came up with the term the dismal science dismal um, at the time or previously was associated with the devil and darkness um, and th this was a literal play on the uh, on the fact that economists were defending the rights of dark skinned people who were right. enslaved in the in the Caribbean. So it's an ancient trope, right? White supremacist trope that, you know, whiteness gets associated with upward motion and enlightenment and so on, whereas uh, uh, black, dark colors get associated with downward uh, movement, you know, obscurantism, uh, uh, hell, and so on. And by putting economics in the second category, I, I mean, the origin of that term could not be more racist, right? And yep. yet people don't know this, like what a PR opportunity uh, that economists have completely bungled. No. No. Yeah. And now sort of tying all of this back into your book, and specifically, this is probably my favorite chapter on game theory and community building. So what I like is that what you guys are saying, uh, especially you, Alan, in terms of bringing up podcasting, is we're saying that in order to change the sort of the individual, that we have to change the cultural zeitgeist, that essentially it takes a village, right? It's not going to take one particular person. So Eric, what I love is that essentially you use game theory and you tell us that in order to change individuals, if we have certain kind of incentives that may not necessarily be spoken of because I mean, it's kind of shameful, but we have certain incentives to be selfish. So, uh, and this kind of harkens back, we had Moisha Hoffman on the episode, on our podcast on an episode ages ago. And he kind of made the same point where he said, look, man, he's like, if you're going to change a person's bad behavior, you have to change your incentive system or the incentive structure. And I love that. So you bring in an economist named Eleanor Ostrom, and I love her conception of beyond markets and states. So this is so cool for me because we often get stuck in this paradigm and this reductive paradigm of communism versus capitalism capitalism. You know, do we want the markets or do we want the states? And she essentially argues like, no, no, we don't really need either in the way that we think of that above them. We don't need them in these extreme forms. Mm -hmm. So what she says is essentially now we're going into game theory is essentially fun. What well, we're fundamentally changing the structure of incentives for people. So what does that mean? Right. That means it's not that it's, a, it's not that there's a kind of government or, uh, you know, the market, the invisible hand that's doing this. It's essentially us. We're doing this as a community. We're saying like, look, man, if the incentive structure for me is going to be really difficult and it's going to make it really difficult for me to do the right thing, right? I'm willing to work with the rest of you to change that structure for all of us. So it's like, I get that I have these temptations and these traps that I want to fall into. So I'm going to try my best not to do that. And I love the example that you give. So Eric, can you tell us a little bit first about <laughs> game theory? And then can you give us the example? Because for me, I love it. I thought that that example was so perfect because I can find myself in that situation thinking like, you know what? I want to do the selfish thing, but if he and I work together, I can see how I can overcome that. Mm -hmm. 
You're talking about the prisoner's dilemma yes, example. Yes. Yeah, yeah, so classic story in economics, right? The basic setup is like you have two prisoners. They've been caught uh, uh, by police. They've been separated and they're being interrogated. Um, the DA comes to them, each of them individually, and says, look, I have enough evidence to to get you convicted of a lesser crime. If I get you convicted of a lesser crime, you'll go to jail for two years. Um, but I know you've committed a, a major crime as well. I just can't prove it. Um, uh, and uh, what I want you to do is to cheat on your partner, to, to confess the crime to me. That way um, you get, don't need to go to jail for, for quite as long. So the basic story is that if these two people cooperate with each other and stay mum, they go to jail for two years, which is not great, but still pretty good. If uh, um, both of them, um, if one uh, speaks uh, when the other one stays mum, then the one who stays mum goes to jail for 20 years and the other one walks. If both of them uh, confess, um, then uh, both of them will get convicted of the major crime, but they'll get 10 years off. So they'll go to jail for, for 10 years. Okay. So basic story. What are they going to do? Well, if they're rational and they only care about not going to jail and they're not they're doing this on a repeated basis, well, then no matter what the other guy does, each individual has an incentive to confess. Um, because if the other one stays mum by confessing, the other prisoner can walk. If the other one confesses, well, then by confessing, the other guy can get 10 years instead of 20 years. So you don't even need to know what your partner is going to do. It's going to be rational for you anyway to defect, as people say. And because both people think in these terms, both of them are going to defect and they're going to end up with an outcome that's like worse than an outcome that was available to them by staying quiet. Some of you will have seen the movie A Beautiful Mind, right? About John yeah. Nash, who sort of came up with, with game theory. We still, he was one of the critical figures and we call it a Nash equilibrium after him. And so the Nash equilibrium is a situation where um, that's a lot worse than it, it could have been. And there's a point in the movie when a professor says something like, do you understand that you're rejecting like 200 years of economic history here? And the point is that in economics, we're, we're used to thinking of situations where individual rational behavior leads to good outcomes. This is what Adam Smith was on about when he talked about the invisible hand, right? It's a situation where all of our efforts lead to a desirable outcome. But in the prisoner's dilemma, we have a situation that's the opposite of that, where individually rational behavior leads to really bad outcomes. And this is the sort of situation I was talking about at the beginning where like nobody intended that bad outcome, right? Nobody wanted that to happen. That outcome happened as a result of goal-directed individual behavior. And if you want to change this, it's not going to be any good to go to the people and say, no, 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 you should stay mum, right? You should cooperate. You should be good. What you need to do is to change the, the incentives, the incentive structure that makes people behave like this. So for example, right, um, suppose the prisoners before they commit their, their crimes, go to a local gangster or mafia boss or something, and they say, hey, if we ever speak to the police, right, if we ever confess, we want you to come kill us, right? That sounds like it could never be in your interest to go to a mafia boss and tell them to kill you if you do X, Y, and Z, right? But given that you've said that ahead of time, when you end up in the DA's office, you have an incentive to stay mum because all of a sudden you're not looking at walking, right? You're looking at death. Mm -hmm. And so this is a you know gruesome version of the story, but the point is that you, you, if you really want to change behavior, what you need to do is you need to change the incentive structure. You need to change the the situation in which people find themselves. And um, the economist that you mentioned, Eleanor Ostrom, who people really should know more about, she was the first female um, Nobel Memorial Prize uh, laureate for, for one thing. She was uh, puzzled by the fact that some communities across the world managed to, to preserve their resources, whereas other communities did not. Like every community is facing 
uh, limited resources, right? It could be drinking water, it could be stock of fish, it could be forest, it could be uh, basically anything like arable land. All, all communities throughout history have faced these sorts of situations, and some of them really mess up. So Vikings came to Iceland, there were lush forests there, apparently when they got there, they cut them all down, right? Presumably the Vikings knew that cutting down the forest would be a bad thing, but they did it anyway. Where I live uh, near the Baltic, there used to be cod. There's no cod anymore in the Baltic. People overfished and now the cod is gone. What happened here? Well, what Ostrom is saying is that we've found ourselves, people found themselves in a situation that wasn't unlike the prisoner's dilemma in that each individual had an incentive to keep chopping down wood or uh, fishing for cod or whatever. From their individual point of view, that was rational. And um, now you might say, well, we should just tell people to not, <laughs> but that's not going to be very efficient, right? And then she's looking at communities that have succeeded in dealing with these sorts of, of situations. And what she finds is that these communities have managed to build institutions where an institution is a set of rules and norms that govern people's interactions with each other. So you might start an association of some kind that allocates rights that says, well, every fisherman can fish this much uh, every week or whatever, or every household can chop down one tree a week or, you know, something like that, right? And what she's pointing to is that humans, wherever humans live together in groups, they've managed to, or, you know, they, they've at least sometimes managed to build institutions that solve problems by building institutions. And so she's developing a whole political philosophy of a good a vision of a good society that's based on sort of an overlapping network or patchwork of institutions that solve problems at the right scale. And this is where she says, um, this is beyond market and state, because if you're talking about an institution sort of delivering something for you, like a neighborhood association or something, it's not exactly an individual solution, right? It's not you and I fixing the problem. It's like some group of us fixing it together, but it's not the state either. And similarly, she sort of rejected the binary between, sort of, um, not, between individual and group, um, and market and state. And so, you know, here are solutions at a, a level between the individual and the collective that isn't quite the market, but that isn't quite the state either. And it's a really appealing vision, I think, of a good society. Yeah, I love that. And it's like, so just to go back to uh, the idea, which I think would be important for our audience, where you said, uh, I'm not going to say this verbatim, but you said something along the lines of, well, if I just tell the person, you know, not to do it, that's not going to be as effective, right? So the way I would think or about- if it's morally- yeah, or morally, right, right, right. So I think what you're essentially saying is that, and going back to uh, Moshe's point too, because I think he made the same exact argument from uh, my vague memory now, um, he's essentially saying that there has to be a structure or a system where there are repercussions, right? So it's sort of like, you know, if I went to Alan and I was like, oh, okay, cool, Alan, can you just like not, you know, fit, overfish? Can you not take out too many out of the pond, mm -hmm. right? My thinking would be, well, you know, if I'm telling that to Alan and then maybe Alan is, you know, sort of saying that to other people and then, you know, maybe that person is saying that to another person, how do I actually know that they're not going to do that because it's just word of mouth. So then if I'm thinking, okay, the likelihood is that Alan will overfish and the likelihood is that the person he tells not to overfish will also overfish, then it makes the most rational sense for me just to overfish too. So we're sort of stuck in this cycle where we're all just overfishing and we're all kind of screwing each other over. <laughs> There are great examples of this, and by great, I mean really sad. So there are yeah. like recurring shortages, right? For a while during the pandemic, it was toilet paper. People were hoarding mm -hmm. toilet paper. And um, more recently, in some places, um, painkillers have been in short supply. And very often, like some public official will go out and say, hey, hey people, don't hoard painkillers. Don't do not do it, right? <laughs> Which, one, bad. it's not, it's not going to make it right. It's bad of you to do this. And like one, it's not going to make a difference. Right, So the evidence suggests that this sort of appeal really doesn't do much good at all. Like people aren't moved by these sorts of conceptions. And then two, somebody who m might not even have thought about hoarding toilet papers or, you know, painkillers or whatever, might suddenly get the idea. They might hear, oh, everybody else is out hoarding toilet paper or whatever. I better do that too. And so by ignoring the way humans work and the norms and the institutions that govern our behavior, these 
officials sometimes make things worse. Um, and so what the, the, the situations that Ostrom talks about that really worked are situations where people form little groups or associations that develop rules and where the rules are associated with consequences. So we might start an organization that distributes the right to chop down trees, for example. And if Alan goes out there and chops down twice as many trees, then we're going to penalize him by telling him he can't chop down any trees for a year or something. And that's going to keep him in line. Now, why would somebody agree to being bound by these rules? Well, the point is that it's in our interest to agree to being bound by these rules. It's different, right? But it's a little bit like going to the local gangster. It's like, we'll agree to abide by certain constraints. And the reason why we do that is that the constraints are legitimate and they're in our interest. And so if you can think of institutions like that to save forests, to save fish stocks, to prevent deserts from, from spreading, you might do a whole lot of, of good, certainly a lot more good than preaching about it, just telling people they shouldn't do whatever they're obviously doing. Yeah, and if you really want to send the message to Alan, you can chop off his hands for every tree he chops. Let's not, <laughs> let's not do that. <laughs> let's not, but hey. Uh, no, so uh, as far as... Um the principles sort of that go behind maybe changing um, an individual or, or sort of a mass uh, group of people's uh, sort of behavior. Um, what I recall from the book is you have to convince them that it's uh, something <clears throat> that's good for them, <clears throat> that's in their best interest, and then essentially that they won't be judged uh, for the change in behavior. And I forget the last part, but it was very interesting to me because I was wondering how to apply it sort of on an individual level. Mm -hmm. But um, I find, I, yeah, I find it very interesting because like the 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 things in the in your book that sort of um, outline the process of how to get someone to uh, change or a group of people change, it's very interesting. I actually don't see that kind of information in in a lot of books. Usually, a lot of books sort of highlight what an issue might be but not necessarily give a solution yep. or even if they give a solution i like the way that you highlight it it actually feels very simple and sort of practical yeah, and, and i just want to add to that right so the idea of going beyond markets and states what i love about it is that let's say if we're doing dealing with somebody who's uh let's say super oppositional or anti-authority and they're saying something like well i don't want the government to tell me whether or not to wear a mask or i don't want the government to tell me whether or not to get vaccinated so what i love about ostrom's ideas is that we're going now back to the community and that we're saying like no dude it's not that we're telling you what to do we're all collectively agreeing that this is what's best for all of us. So it's not, oh, here, the tyranny of the many versus the few. That's not what we're doing. We're trying to tell you that, hey, dude, the way for you to live and to survive is for you to get with the program, for you to do the things that we're doing too, and for you not to overfish, for you not to chop down too many trees, and in this case, for you not to wear, or for you to wear a mask. And and also to convince them why it's yeah. uh, good for them, right? As opposed to this is wrong or you're morally doing the wrong yeah, or you're an idiot or whatever like no we're doing this together yeah yeah right yeah no exactly and um there's so many good examples of this i think the the chapter about changing behavior that you mentioned alan was uh, focuses on uh, the work of christina bikiri who's a game theorist at the university of, of pennsylvania also an amazing uh, uh person and an economist she spent a lot of time looking at norms so the norms that govern our our behavior or whatever and she's one of the people who say that just like preaching is not going to make a, a difference. But um, one or some of the things that she says that are so important is that one, even if norms are really stable and seem impossible to shift, that need not be true. Sometimes norms can shift quite quickly. And if you do it right, if you intervene in the right way, it might be in people's interest to shift. So she's been working with UNICEF in Africa and Asia uh, to shift behavior in, in various situations. And one of the things that she writes about is female genital mutilation. So it's obviously a much more complex phenomenon, but the story that she tells is, is uh, goes something like this, like very often female genital mutilation is driven by older women, mothers, aunts, and so on, who are concerned that their daughter might not get married if she's uncut. 
as long as all the girls in the community uh, have undergone, the, have been subjected to the procedure, if one girl is not, you might worry that she might not be able to get married, find a husband, provide for you, the parent, um, and the relatives in old age, and and so on. But in in many of these contexts, like the the women don't really want to subject their daughters to this. They do it because they feel that they have to because of the daughter's future and and the, their status in the community and and so on and so if you can get everyone together and um, shift their behavior at the same time so that nobody subjects their daughters to female genital mutilation well then you're in a situation where none of the girls are cut and then you don't need to worry that they won't get married right because nobody nobody in that generation is and um, this isn't just like a, a pipe dream she's been working with unicef as i said in real communities on site and um, sort of one of the wonderful things about this is that you don't need to come in she doesn't need to come in with her value system saying you know this behavior is is bad this is this is wrong but rather she can come in to the community talking to them about what sort of community they would want to live in and if you do it right in a in a you know, way that respects people, auton people's autonomy and, and so on, you can shift behavior from one equilibrium to another quite, quite quickly and quite effectively. Eleanor Ostrom wrote about this as well. And so she was also concerned that people might think of her as like descending from the ivory power, uh, ivory tower, telling people what to do. But she said she's not really trying to impose her values of a, a community. What she's trying to do is to help the community develop institutions that work for them, that satisfy their goals and purposes and uh, that appeal to their values. And so she ended up describing herself as a sort of midwife, as a person who, who comes in and uh, delivers uh, institutions that are born from the community themselves and that you know work for the people who live there. And so there's a, a, a very appealing side to the story, which has to do with respecting people's autonomy, their right to make their own decisions and so on, while recognizing that you can shift behaviors relatively quickly as an, an, a, a midwife in this sense. Right. And I love that you bring in the concept of pluralistic ignorance. So meaning if somebody were to go into these communities and they were to ask like, maybe individually one-on-one, -on -one, they were to ask like, hey, are you okay with female uh, general, uh, mutilation. general mutilation? Yeah. 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 If, are you okay with that? Most people would say no. And then you could possibly say, well, you know, I just spoke to those 10 other people over there and they weren't okay with it either. So why is this the norm? And then everybody kind of gets together and they think, hell, what the fuck are we doing? Yeah, I, I, you know, I, it's not, I don't want to be, you shouldn't be naive about it, right? I don't want to mm -hmm. signal that it's easier than it is, but it's yeah, yeah. doable and it's been proven, uh, you know, on site. And so here's a strategy that we can use and across the world, right? We can use it in our countries as well, because we're facing the same sort of situations. And to sort of um, transition a bit, uh, this is something definitely I wanted to bring up during this podcast hmm. um how can one use uh, economics to sort of live a happier life mm -hmm. and then maybe let me look at the time all right in the interest of time it'll be a two-part question <laughs> how can someone use economics to live a happier life and then also if somebody wanted to become uh let's say rich or at least affluent it, what what is a practical way they can go about doing that uh, i'll try to address those questions together so and i want to begin by saying like economics is not going to like make you rich guaranteed right mm -hmm. get rich quick schemes don't exist if somebody approaches you with one you should uh, not talk to them whatever what economics can give you are sort of little tools that you can implement that on the average like on the margin meaning like from where you're at can help you move in the right direction. And when it comes to saving money, lots of people get seduced by various new schemes, uh, Bitcoin and blockchain and crypto and, and so on, right? And in that general space, there are lots of promises of getting rich quick or whatever. Economists will tell you by and large to be extremely skeptical of that and to invest if you can in index funds. So mm -hmm. index funds are the mutual funds, funds that are managed by a bank or some institution that basically it'll 
spread your investments across the entire uh, uh, stock, uh, across every stock in, in the market, roughly, so that your investment will track uh, uh, an index. What that means is that you're not guaranteed to make any money, right? You might still lose. But on the average, on the whole, this is going to give you the best bet of getting rich of any of the strategies out there. And this is another thing that economists agree on, actually. Like, there are lots of jokes about economists being unable to agree on, on stuff. Mm. But if you mm. ask them, overwhelmingly, they will say that if you're not a professional, right, and if you don't have inside information, which, by the way, it's illegal to trade on, right, what you should do is to try to save if you can and, you know, put it in index funds, uh, uh, by and large. When it comes to happiness, the story is similar. There's nothing that's going to, you know, guarantee, there's nothing that will make you happy guaranteed if somebody promises you that it's going to be a scam or something right you should not listen to them but there are a couple of things that that you can do that should help you on the margin one of them is not comparing yourself to others so much this is very hard to do if you're driving down the freeway you're going 60 whatever if the next car is going 70 you're going to feel like you're traveling slowly right you might be tempted to speed up whereas if you're overtaking somebody doing 50 you're going to feel like you're making good speed, right? You're driving fast. It's difficult for us to assess like how well we're doing in life on some absolute scale. It's a lot easier to sort of look over your shoulder and look around and see like, how are the other people doing, right? What about my brother-in-law? What about the neighbor? And you find a, when you do that, you find yourselves in the, you know, keeping up with the Joneses sort of situation where you might be trying to get a nicer car than your neighbor. Um, you might succeed for a brief period, but then if your neighbor is like you, uh, they're going to try to get a nicer car than you have. Right. And then they're best more in that car and you're going to move up like this. So like relatively speaking, nobody will have gained, but in absolute terms, you will have lost because you're plowing money into cars that you could otherwise have spent on things that are more likely to, to make you happy. Right. So and that's just one thing that I think is, is real useful. And I think we could all probably think about this a little bit. If you think about your salary or, you know, whatever race you got, like it's really hard not to think about what races the other people got, but spending too much time thinking about that is a pretty surefire way of being unhappy. And uh, if you can avoid it, you know, that might be good for you. 100%. Definitely uh, comparing with others instead of paying attention to what's going on with you and, and your surroundings. Definitely. Um, could you maybe speak on uh, the concept of opportunity cost, uh, what that is, and, and how maybe if somebody understood what opportunity cost is, how that could really benefit them? Yeah, so opportunity cost is like one of the most basic concepts in economics. If you take an intro course, you might learn it the first or second week or something. Yeah. Um, and it's basically like the best option that you uh, do not choose when you make your choice. If you decide to spend an evening like going to the movies, uh, right, there are two hours right there that you could have used in some other way, like listening to your eminent podcast, for example, mm -hmm. right? And the basic thought here is that in order to make wise choices, you have to pay attention, not just to what you're doing, but to all the things that you're not doing, and uh, the value of those other things. And this is an idea that has a lot of explanatory power. So during the pandemic, journalists were some would sometimes call me as a behavioral scientist asking like why do people do these crazy things like can you explain like what's going on here mm -hmm. and at some point there were data suggesting that young people were more reckless than old people um so there were journalists looking around and they saw people hanging out in parks they saw people you know standing too close to each other in restaurants and bars and whatever and uh, many of them were were young people and so people journalists would call me and they'd say like what's wrong with the young people like don't they get that there's a pandemic or whatever and i'd point out two things one is that the people that you see in bars and parks behaving irresponsibly is a sharply biased sample, right? Mm -hmm. All the people who are home being responsible, like studying or something, they're not visible to us, right? So we need to factor in like all the people we can't see. But then too, like you have to think about the opportunity cost 
of staying in. So if you're like me, you know, middle aged, comfortably off with a couple of kids, a relatively large apartment, you know, more books than I can read, uh, more wine that I should drink, uh, not going outside is not such a big deal for me. It's basically what I would have done absent the pandemic, right? I don't go out that that much. So to me, staying in is not a big deal. But then you think about a young person, somebody you know, maybe shares a room, living with their parents. Some young people are dealing with uh, challenges like domestic violence, uh, drug mm -hmm. problems, alcohol abuse, and so on. Asking somebody like that or staying in for a person like that is a very different proposition, right? The cost is much uh, uh, higher. And the key here is to think about the opportunity costs. And if you do, you'll see that the situation facing the average middle-aged person and the average young high school student is very different. And if high school students more frequently choose to go out, even when the recommendation is to stay in, that doesn't need to mean that they're less responsible or less morally advanced or anything. It probably just reflects the different opportunity costs. And so it's a really sort of powerful idea in that respect. When it comes to our, our personal individual behavior, I think it's useful too. So mm -hmm. um, we tend to focus a lot on the thing that we currently have in mind. You're thinking of like upgrading your phone, maybe get the latest iPhone or buying something, a fancy car or, you know, a new sparkling watch or something like that. Sure. You might think that the car or the watch or the phone or something will make you real happy. Um, and if you spend too much time thinking about that, you're likely to underestimate the amount of happiness or the benefits that you can get from investing in something else, right? Whatever the dollar amount is, if it's 10, 100, or, you know, 10,000, there are other things out there that you can do with the same money. One, you can save it, right? You can give it to somebody. You could uh, invest it in something that has to do with friendship. You can ask if you could take your friends for coffee, right? Um, there are lots of things that you can do with, with that money. And obviously you can't think through like every single thing you could possibly do with any given amount of money, right? That's too, that's overwhelming. But yeah. forcing yourself to think about like, what could I do for this kind of money and this amount of time if I didn't spend it on this thing? I do this a lot. Like I get seduced by the ads, right? There's a new iPhone, you know, I really want it. Like I want it now. And so mm -hmm. I have to have to I have to talk me out of of the urge to go buy one. And this is the way that I do it. It, it works much of the time. Yeah, an opportunity cost is, is such an incredible uh like of course it is a, an easy concept. It is something taught in, you know, uh Eco 101, but uh it's so powerful in the sense that when you start to ask yourself, what else can I be doing with my time? It it encourages metacognition, right? You, you, you can't even be, I mean, if, as long as you have this concept in mind, you can't be stuck on a particular thing, like whether you are thinking about that next iPhone, or it could even be, let's say, ruminating thoughts, or, or just, let's say you're, you're in your head, you're thinking about something. Maybe all of a sudden you think about opportunity costs. What else could I be doing with this time? Right, right. Maybe- Maybe I shouldn't be thinking about this thing over and over again, <laughs> whatever it is, uh, per, right. for example, right? Uh, or staying in versus going out or- um, Dating this person versus dating this other person, right? Uh, I mean, yeah. it applies in every domain of life. And I love that you mentioned that about it being a simple idea because it is, but at the same time, it's like hard to- bring into practice. Lots of economic yeah. ideas are like this, like Nash equilibrium. It's a situation where nobody can do better by changing their behavior. It's something that you can express in like 10 words, 12 words, something like that. Mm -hmm. But it's really hard to like grasp. You, you know, I'll teach it, people will repeat it back to me, then I'll put an example on the blackboard and it will all fall apart. It's yeah. really hard to grasp the meaning of this. And I think it's because many of these ideas are kind of deep. Um, we don't think of economists as as philosophers, um, but many of these ideas are are really deep and they're really powerful. And if mm -hmm. you train yourself to use them wisely, right, responsibly, <laughs> um, it can actually make you a much better human being. 
Yeah, and I like that going back into your chapter on saving, and in this case, you know, being rich. Uh, so I like that saving is a part of becoming rich. So I think a lot of times when people think about what to spend their money on, nobody can actually, they don't have the forethought to think through what would it be like, let's say, to save, I don't know, 10% of your salary. Like, how much will you exactly make? So I love that in that chapter, you actually do the math and you would say, okay, if let's say you would save 5% of your salary for X amount of time. And obviously, these are pretty rough numbers because, you know, the economy changes, inflation happens, you get raises, whatever, right? Obviously, all that is going to be taken into account. But I like the fact that when you're looking at it, you're saying, hey, look, if you're saving even 5%, you can probably retire with at least five or six extra years of your salary. I think that's so foreign to people because when you think of something like a like the number, right? 5%, you're like, what's 5% of my salary going to do, right? So you're thinking, okay, I got paid this week. You know, okay, I could buy an iPhone or I could save this, right? Eh, it's only like 500 bucks. What's that really going to do? And then the next time, you know, that's maybe another like 200 bucks. What's that really going to do? So I think for a lot of people, when they look at those end numbers, and they think, oh my God, you're telling me I could get like six or seven more years of salary in my retirement on top of you know whatever I was already making. It's so astounding for us that I just don't think with those basic numbers, we can actually fathom it. And super, super quick, uh, compounded interest, for example. Yeah. I, I wasn't taught about that in, in school. Yeah, I had oh, to, you weren't, yeah. No, I had to read about that. Uh, I got lucky. I mean, I wouldn't even, <laughs> I, but I read it later than I probably should have. I read it- uh, Yeah. Mid yes, 20s. Uh, I, it would have been great if I knew about index funds, you know, maybe early 20s. Right, right. And then who knows where I would be, you know, 20 years from now, you know. But so there's a chapter on financial literacy, which is something we haven't even gotten to, right? And, um, you know, it's true that not everyone can save. It's not within, you know, everyone's freedom of action. And um, saving more is not like a general solution to poverty or oppression or whatever. But many people could probably squirrel away like a, a small quantity of, of money. And if you can, and you invest it wisely, if you can forego like some luxury expenditures that aren't strictly necessary and so on, you can open up possibilities downstream, which could be really useful. Yeah. And so I don't want to get off of this before, or I don't want to end the podcast before we get on this topic because, uh, or before we cover this topic, uh, just because I think it's super important. So I love in your happiness chapter that you distinguish between comfort and pleasure. So oftentimes we think of those as being conflated. And when we think of happiness, we think, well, that's what I want, right? I want to be sort of uh, kind of rolling in the dough and really happy while also being safe from any danger at the same time. But what you're saying and what you did say is that essentially the two are fundamentally they're distinct concepts, right? They're not necessarily mutually exclusive but they are distinct. And oftentimes we think of a comfort as a really good thing, but yet, and this is going into now the hedonic treadmill, what happens is when you get trapped in comfort, a lot of bad things happen to you in terms of kind of emotional responses or reactions. So what you distinguish between is again, how pleasure in this case would be uh, kind of the better thing to be sought after as opposed to comfort, which is nice for a while, but then it also becomes stale. So can you talk a little bit about that? And also the yeah. example that you gave. Yeah. So this is an idea that goes back to Tibor Skitovsky, who is an economist in the 70s, right? It's been floating around for a while. And he draws this distinction where comforts are things like a new fancier bed, uh, you know, bigger car, a, a bigger kitchen, that sort of thing, if you don't strictly speaking need it. Whereas pleasures are things like, you know, enjoyable conversation with a friend, the feeling of having reached the summit of some mountain you've never climbed before and whatever. And the difference, he says, or the critical difference is that comforts are things we get used to. Uh, whereas pleasures, we don't. And so the new car, the new bed, whatever, it's going to feel great. It's going to feel great for a couple of days or weeks, maybe months. But then after a while, you'll get used to it and you'll be every, every bit as happy or unhappy as you were before you made the investment. Whereas pleasure, like you know, climbing a mountain or spending time with your best friend or something like that, something you're not going to adapt to in, in the same way. So the mistake that people make, he says, is that they spend too much on, on comforts, too much on cars and beds and material belongings like that, and too little on the things that give them pure pleasure. And that's where we should uh, aim our, our efforts. Now, I don't even remember what example I used. Oh, the headphones, uh, you know, the headphones. Know? The, the the speakers yeah oh, yeah. yeah 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 so in grad school at some point i invested what seemed to me then an unreasonable uh, amount of money in uh, speakers they're also kind of too large for my apartment whatever so they're a little oversized and whatever it's an unwise investment you might think but these speakers have given me so much pleasure over over the years like i have not adapted to the sound of music coming out of these uh, speakers and i'm 
guessing it has to do in part with the fact that we hear so much crappy music elsewhere, mm -hmm. like in elevators and drugstores and whatever, we're exposed to bad music played out of bad speakers, right? So, so by contrast, this gives me a lot of joy. But this also seems to be, you know, kind of pleasure. Listening to crisp music gives me pleasure um, that's worth a lot of comfort in terms of happiness. Yeah, if I had to guess, what I think is going on is there's a sort of reinvention because there's something new. So it's not just the speakers, it's the music as well. So there's constantly, I'm assuming, to whatever extent, right. some new music, right, sort of being yeah, pumped yeah. into those speakers. So if you think about that, even in terms of relationships, so let's say I prefer, I don't know, a car to a girlfriend, hypothetically, right? Or maybe the car is a means to that. But the thing is, with the car, it's not going to be new, right? With the relationship, you're always dealing with new problems. You're always developing it, progressing it, growing it. Whereas like with the thing or the item, I mean, if it's just the same and if it doesn't change, eventually it becomes stale. Not Unfortunately, true. I thought of five counter examples, but you know, <laughs> I'm with you. I mean, the, well, first of all, the car could have amazing speakers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah well, okay. So you're fine. Yes. But that's the speakers themselves. That's not the car. I'm joking, but, yeah. oh, but then you can drive to new places. Right, but no, okay, yes, but then it's the places themselves. You could drive you... people, your friends. You could drive but this it's the other friend, friend but it's not the car. But you see, it's, it's not the it's it's, part of it's yeah. not the car. <laughs> it's not the car. I, your yeah. example stands. It just having it's, it's not the car. Right. One so, of the but, things that economics teaches is that you know what you should do depends on all sorts of things. It depends on the facts, right? Yeah. Um, psychological facts, but it also depends on your individual circumstances and your personal preferences. And so it's mm -hmm. perfectly possible for you guys to find that investing in a car and not investing in a car is like the right thing to do, given where you are, Alan, you are, Leon. Uh, you, it it 100%, need not yeah. be the same for both of you. Yeah. yeah, that's so interesting. Yeah. But so essentially what you're saying is that pleasure ultimately is the thing to be sought after because comforts kind of get old and they get stale. And even though with pleasures, there's a lot more maybe risk involved, especially with the reinvention of them and sort of maintaining them, right? Sort of maintaining them, growing them or whatever. Fundamentally, this is what makes for a happy life. And I like that you use friendship as an example, because technically with friendships, I mean, they are difficult. These are difficult relationships. You have two people with their own psychologies, their own perspectives, and you're fundamentally trying to make it work and rework it every single time that, you know, you guys kind of get together so but again even though this is sort of the hard part of life that's the part of life that's really worth living i think something similar applies to kids to be honest so mm -hmm. i have three of them and like god knows that your life does not become more comfortable after you have kids right they wake you up in the middle of the night you have to deal with diarrhea and vomit on a regular basis right there's so many things that you have to do that are really not like comfortable and uh, and so on at the same time like having kids like peak experience i think is more intense than not having kids like meeting your kid for the first time like the first time they laugh at you right the first time they mm -hmm. say your name like all these little moments are just like spectacular uh, 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 you know, moments of sheer joy that you might remember for the rest of your life. So the intensity of those moments um, beats out like so many of the other things, like the lack of comforts in people's minds. And I, I think of this in sort of broadly similar terms, like if, if you choose to have kids, if it's what makes for a life well lived for you, mm -hmm. it's not because of the comf comfort, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's because of the peak experiences that you're getting like the intense pleasure like the moment they succeed in bottling the right. hormones or whatever you're on when your child is born right um somebody's going to make a fortune yeah. And I think also what you're saying is that if you want to be happy, you can't get away from difficulty. I mean, the two kind of go hand in hand, whereas comfort is a little bit different. Different. So again, comfort is sort of the, let's say, the negation of difficult stimuli or of you know hard experiences. Whereas when we're thinking of pleasure, pleasure probably comes after the fact or within those difficulties. I think that's right. You can think of comfort or seeking comfort as a sort of defensive pursuit. You know, you're trying to defend yourself against like various feelings that you don't like and so on. Whereas the pursuit of pleasure is a more offensive uh, uh, thing, right? You're seeking out something that's going to feel good for you. Yeah, I love that. All right, Alan, as we start wrapping up, any final questions for Eric? Ah, uh, Yes. Uh, if we wanted to follow you, follow your work, and, and of course, buy the book, uh, where could we do that? I'm on Twitter more than I should be, to be mm -hmm. honest. You can follow me on Twitter. I'm on some of the other sites as well, but I like to put everything that I do on, on Twitter. So that's a good place to, to start. I love connecting with people. I love connecting with people who listen to podcasts and so on. So don't hesitate to reach out. Mm -hmm. I love that. And so Eric, I love the book, man. So far, it's one of my favorites of the year. 
Same here. Thank you so guys, so, so much guys. I love being here and I, I take it I can conclude that I'm the best looking economist you've ever had on. Is that You're right? the best everything economist. The most Every articulate category. Too? Yes, All the right, most articulate, the smartest, <laughs> looking everything all across the board. You are the winner. <laughs> love talking to you guys. Best of luck with everything. Right. See you soon. All right, talk, to, talk to you soon, man. Bye. Bye. That was awesome. All right. So everyone, if you want to follow us, you could follow us at Seize the Moment Podcast <laughs> on Facebook, on Instagram, and on Twitter, where it's Seize underscore podcast. Like, subscribe, hit the bell on, on YouTube. YouTube. And thank you again so much for watching and see you next time.